When I was growing up in St. Louis in the late 40s, I was an avid St. Louis Cardinals fan, except when Satchel Paige was pitching for the St. Louis Browns, our crosstown rivals. He was the oldest rookie ever in the big leagues, playing his first game when he was 42 years of age. The reason for that, of course, is that he was relegated to the Negro League until Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier the year before. Satchel retired in 1953, but amazingly, he came out of retirement at the age of 59 to pitch for the Kansas City Athletics and threw three shutout innings. I kind of feel like the Satchel Page of First Free here today. I, I only wish I was just 59, and I'm not promising a shutout. I don't know what a shutout would be in the pulpit, but Josh gave me the freedom to choose my theme today, so I've decided to share a message about suffering. We lost a dear friend this week, uh, one who suffered a lot in the last weeks and months of his life, and many of us suffered with him as we saw him decline. This morning, I want us to think seriously about the question of why God allows suffering in his children's lives. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul makes a rather startling statement. He says, For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The NIV is even more shocking as it translates, I am content with, I delight in. Paul's mindset towards suffering obviously stands in stark contrast to the culture we live in today. The health wealth preachers who seem to dominate the religious airwaves have had a powerful and dangerous impact. Because of them, countless professing Christians have come to believe that good health and relative wealth are part of their present inheritance as believers. They expect preferential treatment from God, not only in respect to the spiritual blessings he promises to us in Christ, but also regarding financial, medical, relational, mental, and physical health. They just need to name it and claim it, or they need to increase their faith. Of course, it helps to send in a generous offering to the preacher's ministry. Let me state as clearly as I know how, the doctrine of preferential treatment is a myth, a false doctrine, a heresy, if you will. God has not promised his children that they will avoid natural disasters, unemployment, broken relationships, mental illness, poverty, dementia, cancer, or even death. As far as I know, Christians suffer from trials like these to roughly the same degree as pagans or people in other religions. And Christians die at the exact same rate as unbelievers, 100%. Yes, there are some diseases that are brought on by sinful behavior, and believers who live faithfully in godly lives will uh, largely avoid those particular maladies, but on the whole, the experience of born-again Christians is not that different from non-Christians in respect to suffering. In fact, a strong biblical argument could be made for the fact that we should expect more suffering because persecution for our faith is an additional trial that unbelievers generally don't have to deal with. The church today needs a philosophy of suffering that is based on truth not wishful thinking, based on solid theology and not the heresy that is being spread by so many. If there were no other evidence that health wealth theology is false, the mere example of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians would reveal such a view to be a lie. I want to read just a smattering of passages from this book 
that reveals how this apostle, the great missionary, theologian, and apologist of the Christian faith, suffered. First of all, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians 6. As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Next chapter. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. 2 Corinthians 11. I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, had been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And finally, 2 Corinthians 12, a thorn was given to me, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now you tell me, does that sound like preferential treatment to you? And this is the experience of the greatest the most gifted, godly, faithful servant of God, do we think we should escape trials and trouble and suffering? Now, I want to give our attention for the next few moments to a passage from the first chapter of 2 Corinthians that focuses on why God allows suffering in the believer's life. Will you stand as you are able as we read 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11? It's page 964 in the Pew Bible. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oops, I'm reading from NIV there. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in, my, in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord.
In this passage, Paul begins to develop a philosophy of suffering, and that continues throughout the letter. He starts with the fact that the character of God is foundational to a biblical philosophy of suffering. He opens with doxology, praise to God for who he is. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I suggest that if you don't have a clear concept of who God is, you will never develop a healthy attitude towards suffering. We've seen an enormous amount of suffering lately in this world, in Ukraine, in Israel, in Gaza, uh, in the areas where tornadoes have hit, to say nothing of suffering within our own congregation. I've noticed a stark difference in attitude exhibited by various victims of suffering. Some people get angry and bitter. And they curse God and man. They are hopeless and demanding. But others who suffer just as much are grateful to be alive and thankful for all the help they receive. They're hopeful, determined to rebuild. What makes the difference? Well, I suppose in some cases it reflects on their personality traits or their family support. But I think in many cases, the impact of whether or not they know God is accountable for their attitude towards suffering. Without God as a foundation, it's no wonder that people get bitter at the cards and impersonal mother nature deals them. Despite all his own suffering, Paul never saw God as his enemy or felt neglected by him. Rather, he praises him as the God, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. By calling attention to God's fatherhood, I think he brings to mind the fact that fathers don't purposely hurt their children. The only time they allow their child to suffer as when they're being disciplined is in order to achieve a greater good. God is the father of mercies. Mercy is pity shown to the undeserving. It is pardon for rebels. Paul understood God's mercy very much from his own personal experience. He was painfully aware of the many wasted years where he hated Christ and Christ's followers. Yet when Paul was at his very worst, God befriended him and as a loving father showed him mercy. And Paul never got over that. He also praises him as the God of all comfort. The word comfort is used nine times in the next four verses. To our modern minds, comfort sometimes induces images of soft cushions and warm baths and luxury lodging. But originally it was a tough, invigorating word describing how God comes alongside and encourages us with a new perspective. I think about a basketball team that is, is being soundly defeated and they go into halftime and come out a different team and the color commentator is likely to say something like, I wonder what the coach said to them during halftime. Well, he comforted them. He encouraged them. He came alongside and helped them get a new perspective. They may not have enjoyed everything he did in his comfort or said to them, but it worked. The word encourage is a close synonym. Having drawn attention to the nature of God as a merciful and encouraging father, Paul now applies these character traits to the fact that suffering is normal and to be expected in every believer's life. Notice the wording there of verse 4, where he says that God comforts us in all our affliction. He doesn't say he comforts us if we happen to run into some trouble. It is assumed that trouble will be part and parcel of every Christian's experience, and it is. If you think you know a Christian whose uh, life is easy and untroubled, you don't know him or her 
very well. Of course, troubles are not evenly distributed, and we don't all experience the same kind. But the fact is, suffering is an inescapable reality in this fallen, evil world. Eliphaz, one of Job's so-called counselors, declared, Man is born to trouble as sparks fly upwards. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, lamented, Why did I come from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend all my days in shame? The fact that life is often filled with trouble and sorrow and pain and disappointment and despair, even for God's choicest servants, is the consistent testimony of Scripture, and it is the personal testimony of saints down through the centuries. The question that arises in every thinking person's mind is why? Why does God, who is all-powerful and all-loving, allow it? First, I would suggest to you that God allows suffering to discipline us for disobedience. Certainly not all pain and suffering is earned in the sense that it is direct punishment for sin. Josh has made that clear in several recent sermons. But some of it is, I'm sure all of us in this room can think of examples where we brought trouble on ourselves. If children misbehave, they face discipline. If teens fail to study, they lose privileges. If a young family overspends its budget, they soon find themselves facing bankruptcy, perhaps. If a person drives while under the influence, he will lose his license, and perhaps worse. The painful sting of suffering reminds us that sin has consequences. C.S. Lewis famously said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. It speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. But as we said, not all pain is disciplined for suffering. Paul's apparently wasn't. A second major reason God allows suffering is to test the validity of our faith. I think of 1 Peter 6, 7 we read, in this salvation you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The point Peter's trying to make there is that God doesn't test us to cause us to fail, but rather to help us succeed. The paradigm example in Scripture of this is, of course, the case of Job, the most faithful man of his day. He went through incredible suffering, losing his wealth, his health, his family. Worse, those closest to him turned against him, with his wife urging him to curse God and die. There was no sin or disobedience in Job's life that generated his suffering, God was testing the validity of his faith in the face of attacks by the evil one. And he passed. And those whose faith is genuine will pass the tests that God allows in their lives, and it will produce confidence and hope and huge blessing once the trial is over. Thirdly, God allows suffering to prepare our hearts for heaven. Trials tend to strip away the worldly resources we so often depend on, leaving us completely dependent on divine provision. And when suffering becomes especially severe, it can turn our hearts toward home. That's why believers often calmly accept death rather than uh, seeking every available means to extend life after a terminal diagnosis. It's difficult, it's not difficult, I should say, to go on hospice if you know where you're headed. 
Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven, was an incredible blessing to my parents in their 90s as their health was diminishing. They reveled in his descriptions of heaven and even his sanctified imagination that opened up new vistas to see what God has prepared for those who love him. Fourthly, God uses suffering to strengthen us for greater usefulness. God allows bad things to happen in his children's lives because the more they are tested and refined by trials, the more effective they can be in ministering to others. This is the principal point of our text today. Verse 4 says, God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God's comfort is not only to be enjoyed, it's to be passed on. You see, God comes alongside us and, and shows his mercy to us, and then he brings other people alongside us so we can do the same thing for them. Not everyone is called to preach or to teach or to witness before large audiences, but everyone can have a ministry of encouragement. The only training you need is found in the school of suffering. In verse 5, Paul adds, For we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are following Jesus and serving, serving him, we will encounter suffering. Jesus said, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. That's a promise, friends. In Philippians 3.10, Paul describes this dynamic as the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, we like the fellowship of coffee and donuts, and we really love the fellowship of, of uh, church dinners. We're not so fond of the fellowship of suffering, but it's the fellowship of his sufferings that enables the fellowship of comfort. Fifthly, he allows suffering to keep us from relying on ourselves. One of the greatest hindrances to living the Christian life victoriously is self-reliance. And the easier life is, the more we are tempted to rely on ourselves. And that's true in normal human relationships. We would never go to a doctor if we weren't sick. We'd never go to a lawyer if we didn't have legal troubles. We would never go to a counselor if our relationships were all healthy. And we wouldn't turn to God if it weren't for suffering. For the first time in his letter, Paul begins to speak of his own suffering in verse 8. And I like how Eugene Peterson translates it in the message. He says, we don't want you to, uh, in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad, we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row, and it was all over for us. As it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Is that the end of it? Instead of trusting in our own strength and wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. Not a bad idea since he's the God who raises the dead. We don't know exactly what kind of suffering Paul was enduring here. He doesn't give us specifics. But it is obvious from the words that he uses that he was in great anguish. The pressure was relentless. Perhaps some of you have been where Paul is. Maybe you're there today at the end of your rope. What is God saying to you? Well, he has a redemptive purpose. And Paul describes it this way. To make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Suffering breaks the spirit of self-will inside of us that insists on working things out on our own. Suffering forces us to lean on the Lord. And why shouldn't we? For he's the kind of God who raises the dead. What more could we need? Now the final point our passage makes is the deliverance from suffering comes through God 
and through the prayers of Christian people. Look again at verse 10 and 11, where Paul shares from his personal experience. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. God is not only in the business of bringing, or at least allowing, suffering in our lives. He also delivers us once the trouble has accomplished its purposes. Paul expresses great hope in God's delivering power here. But it's a confident hope, not a presumptive one. In recent years, I have noticed some Christians who have been influenced, perhaps inadvertently, by the Word of Faith movement. When they pray, I hear things like, God, I know you have already healed so-and-so of this cancer, when there was no evidence that God had done that. For some reason, they seem to think that claiming God has already done something is a sign of greater faith. It is not. It's a sign of presumption. Paul is doing something quite different here in this passage. He first gratefully acknowledges that God has delivered him from whatever deadly peril he was facing at that time. Then he expresses confidence that God would deliver him in the future, for God had made it clear to Paul that he had some work for him left to do. And then he shares his hope that God will deliver him again. But he doesn't demand it, and he doesn't presume. If Paul's delivered, he knows who's going to do it, God himself. And yet, interestingly, Paul acknowledges another important factor at play in this process. You also must help us by prayer, he says. And then in the last verse, he speaks of the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Friends, our hope must be in God, but our work must be on our knees. God delivers his people through the prayers of the saints. But what if he doesn't? What if we pray earnestly and daily for months for the deliverance of a friend and he dies? Were those wasted prayers? I don't think so. If you prayed faithfully for Pastor Ron, you may have helped to extend his life by weeks or months. You may have helped lessen his pain. You certainly encouraged his heart. And you spent some valuable time communicating with your Heavenly Father. But the question, what if God doesn't deliver, is ultimately answered by that powerful phrase at the end of verse 9. Our God is a God who raises the dead. Paul is speaking of the ultimate deliverance that far exceeds any temporal deliverance we might pray for. You see, this life is not all that there is. There will be a resurrection one day when those who have died in Christ and have put their faith and trust in his shed blood will be raised to new life to spend eternity with him in a new heaven and a new earth. So I guess I need to qualify my sermon title. The myth about preferential treatment is that it is guaranteed in this life. But it's no myth that there is preferential treatment for believers in the next life. That truth is what underlies Paul's confidence in this letter and enables him to face whatever suffering God brings across his path. In the northeastern United States, codfish are a big commercial business. The public demand for eastern cod raised a real problem for the shippers. First, they froze the cod, but they found it lost its flavor. Then they put it in tanks of seawater 
and shipped it across the country, but they found that the flesh had become mushy. Finally, some creative soul solved the problem in a very innovative manner. The codfish were placed in a tank of water along with their natural enemy, the catfish. From the time they left the East Coast until they reached their westernmost destination, these ornery catfish chased the cod all over the tank. And surprisingly, when they arrived at the market, they were just as fresh as when they were first caught, and their texture was still firm. Friends, all, all of us are in a tank of particular and inescapable circumstances. Sometimes it's hard to stay in the tank, but then in addition, there are those God-appointed catfish. Maybe you're living with one of them. <laughs> Maybe it's somebody at work who drives you to your knees regularly. Maybe it's not a person, but a thing. Maybe it's a, an untreatable cancer diagnosis or a looming financial disaster. Your father put those catfish there to keep you from getting soft and mushy and tasteless. They're there to prepare you for home. Don't ever forget the promise that Jesus himself made to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let's pray. Father, when we suffer, help us not to get bitter or angry at you or at one another. Help us not to buy into heretical notions of preferential treatment. May we revel in your comfort and then reach out to others who are hurting the same as we are. May we not rely on ourselves, but on a God who raises dead people. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.